My guest today is Dan Rourke. You know him from his successful YouTube channel, Yankees Avenue, which as of the time of this recording, has 31,800 subscribers and is the largest Yankees only YouTube channel on the interwebs. Since creating the channel, Dan has amassed over 13 million lifetime views. He's known for posting highlights from all Yankees victories, as well as shorter videos where he offers his thoughts on the state of the team. As a fellow Yankees content creator, I thought it would be fun to have a conversation with Dan about our very different journeys and what are some of the best practices for building an effective YouTube channel. And selfishly, I wanted to pick his brain about ideas for growing my own channel and on the pitfalls that await me. But really, I consider myself a novice. So tell me, like, you know, how you got started and like how you became number one. 30,000 subs is crazy. Yeah, well, first of all, number one in terms of size, because to be honest, bro, like I would say you're definitely number one, like content wise, you're definitely number one, bro. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think the main thing I benefited benefited from was uh, I started hella early, as you see, like in the intro, like I started in 2013. Um, but it really just started with like, I was 13. Um, and I wanted to make like an A-Rod highlight video. So I just downloaded Movie Maker, put together a bunch of clips with like horrible, overblown background music. <laughs> And I posted it and it got like 20,000 views, which to me was like crazy. I saw that and like, that's where my addiction to views started. But uh, yeah, like the first few years, I was just making like highlight videos and stuff. And then um, where I guess things really like took off was when I did like the after every Yankees win highlight videos, because those would get like a lot of views. So I think a good portion of my subs came from that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, one day I just kind of, I wanted to talk about like baseball in front of a camera. Uh, my first ever video doing that was uh, it was about Gary Sanchez during his 2019 season. And uh, yeah, I just got in front of the camera, started talking about it and then went from there. And here we are, I guess, 30,000 subs. But I probably watched that A-Rod video. I they were so you. bad, dude. They were so <laughs> bad, though. Horrible. I do remember thinking, like, I wish you would leave the calls in and, and like kill the music a little bit. But dude, my biggest regret is the fact that I would put in like cringy background music, but I don't do that anymore. So yeah, when I mean, yeah. when I first started making videos, I mean, they were horrible. I, I thought they were good. And I would put them out there, man, I spent two hours on this. It's so good. And I go back now yeah. and I'm like, Oh, I got to delete that. It's awful. Bro, facts. Like, I'll be looking back on old videos that, like, at the time, I was like, yo, this is the shit. This is amazing. And then I look back on it, I'm like, oh, my God, how did I post that? You know? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's a good thing about it, though, is I feel like every single video just, like, you know, kind of gives you that learning perspective and you just keep improving, you know? I just read a book not long ago called Peak, and it's about, you know, how if you do anything for at least an hour a day, then your mm -hmm. brain just kind of like builds the pathways to get better at that and to get more efficient at it. And that's why I think that your channel blew up so much is because you were doing every day videos. And so you got efficient at them. And so like a game ends and 20 minutes later, we got the highlights. I always watch your highlights yeah. like two or three times because I, you know, I like <laughs> to study the game, even after I've watched it, half the time when yeah, I'm watching sure. it, I'm doing other stuff. I might not be looking directly at the TV when something happens. So I go back and watch the highlights a bunch of times. So like, that was a brilliant idea. Just having the highlights, you know, every single day. And I think that like building a formula, you know, a lot of guys just want to get on there and make videos, but having a routine that forces you to do something every day, yeah. it really causes you to get good and it gets people used to seeing it every day. So that I didn't even tend on like doing that. Like I wasn't like, Oh, I'm going to post a highlight video after every single win. But I remember in, it was a 2019 season and I just posted the opening day game against the Orioles that we won. And then like, when I saw the views that that got, and, like, not that my videos before that wouldn't get views, but like they got views quick. It was like, I posted it and within a day it had like 25, 30 K or whatever. So then I just, it kind of just snowballed into me doing it every day to where it became like muscle memory in a sense. It's like, game finishes the Yankees win okay got to make highlights and then it turned into like I'm gonna make highlights during the game so that way they're ready to go right after the game ends you know so it, yeah it kind of just you keep doing something so often that it just becomes a habit and it's a good habit to have in our case you know what's all that stuff in your background it looks like you're in a music studio <laughs> bro it, it's such an underwhelming answer yeah because people think like oh I do music when in fact I'm the one person in my family that doesn't do music so like everybody in my family's got a voice everybody's musically inclined like my this is like my dad's music studio um but i just come in here to film because like it's so soundproof and i don't want to have like noise from my house getting into the video and whatnot so it's just like the perfect place to film 
And uh, I feel kind of bad because we actually built like a mini studio in my room. My dad's like one of those guys that's just like handy as hell. Like he can just build anything you want to build. Um, so he built a little like mini studio in my room and it's still there to this day, but not soundproof enough. So I haven't used it once and I just come in here, but uh, yeah, it's, it's nice, I guess, you know, it's kind of weird because like the background kind of feel like throws it off a little bit. Like I'm talking baseball, there's, there's all this like music equipment in the back, but. What are some other things that you've learned along the way that, you know, could be helpful to guys like me who are kind of coming up some of these other smaller channels that are trying to do this. And like somebody said to me, like, why would you have your competitor on the show? And I'm, I'm like, Dan is not a competitor. I don't, I don't see this competitor Seriously, at all. Yeah, no, the, not the, at all. Anybody who does this and is serious about this realizes that the more people that are doing it, it creates more recommendations on the topic and it like builds the network. 100%. The thing on that is that like, for example, like say, I don't know, let's just say the Yankees trade for Francisco Lindor and then you do a video on it. Somebody watches that. There's a very high chance the video that I do is going to be the next recommended video and they'll watch that. So it all kind of just builds off each other. And like, there's a bunch of stuff that I've learned from you. You know, I watch every single one of your videos, which if you were one of my competitors, I probably wouldn't do. Right. And it's kind of just, it, it, we help each other out in that sense where we can learn off each other. And also it helps with the recommended side of things. But uh, yeah, I mean, a tip for like, I guess, creators on the come up the main thing would be this is that there's literally nothing stopping you from doing it like everybody in this day and age has one of these a cell phone if you want to get in front of a camera and just talk and do what me and you do then turn on your phone and just start talking about what you want to talk about and post it you can download a free editor you can download movie maker you can download iMovie it's all for free so like the tools are there um to do it but um yeah I mean the main thing is definitely working hard for sure you know like I feel like if we weren't consistent with our stuff we wouldn't be like I guess as successful as we are, you know, sure. like you mentioned the game highlights. Like if I say, I, you know, I do these highlights every single day and then I miss a week, you know, that kind of defeats the purpose of the whole thing because then, I, then I'm not consistent, you know? Um, and like, same with you and me, when we do like the, the videos talking about whatever's going on, like say a big story happens and we don't talk about it. then like with the consistency not being there, we're not as reliable to like our subscribers to provide the information we're trying to provide, you know? So I said, the main thing uh, is definitely you want to do it. You can do it. And just be consistent with it. You know, you can't fake passion. So, like, if you're passionate about the team, then you should get behind the camera and talk about it. Because in this day and age, I mean, you see, like, the come up with, uh, you know, like, say, Giraffe Nick Mark, for example, Fuzzy. I mean, I'm sure these guys in high school, they never thought they'd be doing what they're doing. And now they're talking baseball for a living. So, Like a catcher or a, a, a bench player becomes really good at managing. Guys who, like, watch the game become better at like talking about the game than guys who actually played the game a lot of times you know so like uh the guys who were the superstars in in high school and college and stuff a lot of those guys are like cutting our lawn and stuff like that but yeah. like the, the people who watched <laughs> get to uh get to actually that's such a good it. point that's honestly i never thought about it that way but it's so true and even like for myself personally so like a little backstory uh for me is that i played baseball like my entire life and then like going into high school um, I was not very good. Like I was like one of those kids that like on the little league field, I was a stud and then go to the big field and I couldn't hit for anything. Uh, but come high school, I played through my junior year and my junior year of high school was, it was a 2017 season. Of course, Aaron Judge's rookie season. You all know how big of an Aaron Judge fan I am. Um, but I remember how much it, it killed me that I was missing this historic rookie season by going to baseball practice for games like I'm not even going to play in which led to me actually quitting high school baseball simply to watch Yankee games my senior year. Cause I'm like, I'm not, because it's the core coming up. I was like, I'm not missing any more than I've already missed. Not that I missed a lot, but like, you know, having to go to a baseball game when I'd rather watch a seven o'clock Yankees, Red Sox game, it hit me. So that year, 2018, I stopped playing baseball simply to watch baseball. Um, and it, that's when it kind of struck me that I've always been more about like analyzing the game, I guess, than playing. So like, that's definitely a real good point. Like we watch it from like, the side and kind of give us like a different perspective on it, you know? Right. Um, I mean, I personally, I played, but you know, I haven't played in so long that for the last, you know, 20 mm -hmm. years, almost, I mean, I play like these summer league games where it's like you play 15 games maybe, yeah. but I still get to watch 150 plus Yankees games a year mm -hmm. just watching constantly. Just, it just kind of builds that. It just ingrains it in your mind. Yeah, for um, sure. You know, I was thinking about it, like, because I, I started with this movie podcast, I was telling you before we started recording, that when I started, it was, um, I wanted to, it actually started weird for me. I, I built a YouTube channel just so I could arrange playlists of, you, of videos that I watched. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, and I'm so anal retentive about it that I, I like organized it. And I was like, wait a second, I can actually put some of my own original content on here of stuff that, you know, I have a little yeah. bit of video skills. 
And so I started making my own videos and I wanted to do movies and things like that. But after maybe a uh, hundred videos about movies and stuff, I started running out of movies that I'd seen. <laughs> Oh, okay, John Travolta, we've got to talk. <laughs> I started yeah, yeah. running out of like knowledge about movies. I was like, I like mm -hmm. movies, but I'm not a director. I didn't go to film school. I can't talk intelligently. Mm -hmm. All I can do is give my opinion. And then with me, it started one day, uh, the Yankees signed a pitcher named Garrett Cole. And so I just did a quick, like 10 minute, just my thoughts on it and started. Uh, it was a year ago yesterday, actually. So Christmas came early. The Yankees have signed Garrett Cole to a nine-year, $324 million contract uh, and just uh, started uh, talking about it. And it got, I don't know, a few hundred views. And my other videos never got that many. So I was like, well, maybe I'll do mm -hmm. more Yankee stuff. And then the next one was the Astros scandal. And that got like 60. Oh, that, that was fantastic for all yeah. content creators. That was gold. Um, but I know it's exactly what you mean. Like when you get, like you post that first video and you get like, a few hundred views and you're just like this is amazing <laughs> um but yeah no, like what you said with that um we're in like a really good position because and this goes for any sports creator um there's always going to be new content you know unless for some weird reason and we almost saw this past year but unless sports go away like we'll always have material to talk about so like with your in the case with your movies like you run out of things to talk about then you're kind of screwed like what do you make content on and that's why i think we'll see a lot of like content creators that you know, blow up and then they kind of just come crashing down. They burn out, you know, because they run out of material to talk about. For us, we know every single year we're getting 162 games and then playoffs, off season news. So like until the day we die and pass that, we'll always have stuff to talk about, you know? So like, we're definitely in a real solid position, all of us baseball content creators and sports content and, creators. And next year it's going to be even better with fans going back to the stands because, oh, you know, because wait. you get new people every, every, every day that go to their mm -hmm. first game. I think about like, if you have a, a, a Yankee stadium that's filled with 42,000 people, there's probably five or 10,000 of them at least that are young, that have yeah. never been to a game and they're going to fall in love. I'm telling you, you go to your first Yankee game, anybody who's not oh, yeah. ever been there, you fall in love instantly. It's a thing of beauty. And, uh, you know, I feel like those people are going to come home and they're going to watch your highlights from the game they were just at. Yeah. And then they're going to get recommended. Talk about it. <laughs> and they're going to get recommended my, my you know, uh, reaction video. So, yeah. like, it's just, it's going to just explode over time, you know, as more and more people, everybody, like you mentioned, has a phone. Almost everybody's got YouTube on their phone. Mm. People have that wait in traffic or that ride on the subway after the game. Yeah. You know, everybody's got AirPods now. You can throw them in and, yep. and, and, and just, you know, relive the experience. And I think that, you know, as, as human beings, you know, people just want to feel good. Um, you know, if, if you go to a game and you win, you want to drag that feeling out. Yeah, so you're just going to keep sure keep coming back and then the next day you you might watch a pregame video or something or you might mm -hmm. you know you know and that's you're... real quick um that's the thing that i just love so much about sports and creating content and whatnot is that like baseball for example no matter what's going on in your life whether you know you're having a good day a bad day you know that like come seven o'clock you got a yankee game on and like that's just three hours as a break from whatever may be going on in your life that say maybe isn't so good um, and then, like you said, you can drag that into, you know, the Yankees post game, watching me in your videos, you know, it kind of just gives you something to escape from, you know, like reality in a sense. And it's productive in our case, because we get to talk videos or talk uh, baseball and make videos about it. And it's just, I, I, that's why I love sports so much. You know, it's really just an escape from reality, you know, when that's not a deep, I didn't mean it like that. Not like I'm <laughs> depressed, but yeah, that yeah. came off really deep. I didn't mean it like that, but you know what I mean? No, it's cool, man. It's cool, man. Uh, how do you deal with negative comments? I'm sure as a mm. fellow Yankees creator, you get inundated with Yankees hate. Like I, every time I do something yeah. on the Yankees, I have a filter that filters out shit like Yankees suck, Yankees really? are cheaters. Like I, and so like every, every time I do a video, at least there's a couple that get caught up. How do you deal with mm. negative comments and trolling and people who just want to get on there and cause you trouble? See, bro, I'm weird with this stuff, and everybody disagrees with me on it. I love it, yo. Like, I like <laughs> negative comments. Believe it or not, like, I endorse it. Let the hate flow through you. Um, something I always say is that, like, sports are at its best when opposing fan bases hate each other. Um, the only thing I'm not a fan of is um, I hate when people will dislike a video because they disagree with the topic, you know? Like, yeah, say, yeah. just for example, like, the Yankees don't resign DJ LeMahieu, and I make a video about it. Because they're not happy about DJ resigning, they dislike my video, you know? Right. Um, but no, I mean, to be honest, like I like negative comments, especially like when they are against the Yankees, because that kind of just helps engagement, you know, because 
if somebody's saying something that's going to piss people off, they're going to respond to that. And that just creates more engagement, you know, more comments, and it's going to promote the video even more. So from that aspect, I endorse it. And I don't know, I think it just kind of makes it a little more entertaining. You know, I'm not sure if you get any like personal insults and whatnot. People will comment like, oh, what's that hairstyle, bro? That <laughs> stuff, I just ignore and laugh at it. But uh, I don't know, I, I guess, I guess it's kind of just good for the channel. It also gives me a good laugh at times. You know, yeah. the ones that really piss me off are the ones against Aaron Judge. Those are the ones I'll really go in on. But yeah. Yeah. People commenting to trade Aaron Judge. I have to like they're I fucking have to, I have idiots. To, I have to pull every ounce of strength within me not to just ah, just yeah. Hammer away. One thing I do like that I have I think that is good is I call it the um well it's a mean word but I'll say it like this like the moron filter where <laughs> if I see somebody say something that it just auto, it automatically registers in my head like okay this person's an idiot I shouldn't give them the time of day so like when they say like oh the Yankees should trade Aaron Judge or this player, like Max Kepler, when that dude, like Max Kepler is better than Aaron Judge. Now, whereas before it used to really piss me off and grab my gears, now they just automatically get registered in the moron filter and I just ignore it, you know, because you know, like they're not worth your time. I'm, I'm trying to get better at like putting a video up there and stepping away from it for a while. Early on, I like to monitor because, you know, uh, I like to see how many views it's getting. I like to kind of estimate, you know, how many, uh, yeah. how much money I'm going to get and how much, uh, how many subscribers or whatever. But now it's like, I just kind of try and step away for a while, put it up, step away, come back and answer the decent comments rather than just like fight with all the bad comments. Uh, yeah. And as far as like the personal stuff, I have what's called the living room rule. And I got this from Joe Scott. I don't know if you watch answers with Joe. I think I've kind of heard about this, but go on. Yeah, this is he did, a, he did a video called 10, like before I even started YouTube, I watched this. It was called like 10 tips for being good at YouTube or whatever. Mm -hmm. And one of them was like employ the living room rule in your comments, which is, if someone disagrees with me, that's fine. I'll leave it. But if someone yeah. says, you know, you suck, you're an asshole, like they attack me personally, something that, that they wouldn't say in my living room to my face over yeah. a video, then I kick mm -hmm. them out. I ban them. I just shadow ban them. That, that makes total sense. Yeah. You know, because I figure if you're not going to contribute to the community, you're just going to mm -hmm. take away from it. You know what I mean? I want the comments yeah. to be. It's like it's it's my only it's my own little kingdom where people can talk yeah. about the topics that I put out there into the world, and so you know I I I, I generally allow bad takes like I won't delete them, um, mm. I will argue with them. But if somebody just says something mean and atrocious to me and filthy, I just you know see you later. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. There's always gonna be those people, you know, like the guys that like you post a video and like they didn't have near enough time to even watch one minute, and there's already a dislike. Like those people that are just automatically against you. Like when it comes to like those comments, like once again, somebody comes out like my hairstyle, which I'm in the midst of growing it out. I'm trying to get a mullet at some point, but it's <laughs> in the awkward stage right now. Uh, but yeah, like personal insults and whatnot, I just leave that to like my subscribers because most of the time if they see something like that, they'll just go at them, you know, and kind of just leave it to them. But uh, that's a good rule. I mean, you'll have to send me the link to that video. I want to watch that. But I have heard about the, the living room rule, and that's a, that's a good thing to go by, yeah. For sure. What misconceptions do you think there are out there when it comes to YouTube content creators? I know a lot of people think that you get a few thousand views that you make a ton of money or whatever. And that's not the case. Mm -hmm. you, you have to make yeah. stuff constantly to make any kind of money and you have mm -hmm. to work your tail off. Um, and then I think a lot of people think that, that people just get on here and talk, but there's a lot of art behind the scenes, you know, that people don't even notice, like knowing how to edit and how to, yeah. you know, how to cut things together and, you know, how to subtly add music cues and stuff that people don't even mm -hmm. realize. So what are some misconceptions that you have that you, uh, have thought about well i mean i i think you hit the nail on the head especially with the first one i mean like the monetization side of it um people think you know you become like a, a youtuber and all of a sudden like you're you're rich you know you can live off of it um and i've just started to see like the financial side of it like i'm starting to get like a, a good income from it um but yeah you really got to work hard at it you know um like if you want to do youtube for a living you're talking like years and years of putting in hard work dedication you know sleepless nights um but also too um it is very like it can become draining in a sense you know like it's not always like sunshine and rainbows like there may be time like times where you don't want to make a video but you you want to be a youtuber you got to do it you know um so yeah, i think it's just like the hard work side of it for sure the monetization side of it and i totally just lost my train of thought bro but yeah the monetization <laughs> side of it for sure all right so since this is the yankees channel and we're kind of moving ahead of pace uh, I think people would want to hear us talk a little bit of baseball. So what are you most excited about for the 2021 season? 
most excited about is definitely going to be a healthy season from Aaron Judge, which I'm banking on. He's going to win MVP. Um, I'm a little bit, you know, going into this offseason, I wasn't fully buying into, like, the Yankees aren't going to spend that much money. I've kind of accepted it now. Yeah. I think we bring, uh, we bring DJ back, and I'm hoping maybe we get a starting pitcher. If we can get one starting pitcher so we can open the season with, a, like, one more veteran than just Garrett Cole, I'll be feeling pretty excited about our chances at the division. I mean, with the core that we have, you know, we always have a chance at the division. But I think what we'll really need to do is get innings from our starters, our young starters, and then we'll, we'll have to make major upgrades at the deadline, I think, at least when it comes to, to starting pitching, because you'll have Cole and then Sebi will hopefully be back, um, you know, July or August, and then maybe go after, like, I guess if we're not going to sign Kluber, but like maybe some guy, like, I'm trying to think, like, Luis Castillo. We need, like, another starter that, like, come postseason time, we can rely on to give us a dominant outing, like, similar to Garrett Cole, you know. So got to get pitching. And if we do, I mean, just like every other year, like, our chances are as good as anybody. Just got to stay healthy. Um, I am excited for the young arms, though. I want to see a full year out of Debbie Garcia, Clark Schmidt as well. Only thing that freaks me out about that is the innings limit. Like, you figure they're not going to be able to give us a full 30 starts, you know, a, a six, seven inning ball. Um, but, yeah, I mean, besides the upgrades we need to make, like I said, our chances are as good as any other, other year with this core. You know, we should be World Series contenders, and if we're not, it'll go down as another failure. Yeah. I'm with yeah. you on Aaron Judge. I was thinking about this the other day. Even guys who are injury prone, as Aaron Judge, in mm -hmm. all fairness, appears to be at this point. Um, even Depends those guys, who you ask. Yeah, even those guys, uh, they generally put together a few seasons in their you know late 20s, early 30s, where they're not injured. I mean, he's due for a yeah. season where he just doesn't get injured. He's going to mm -hmm, take care sure. of himself. He's going to realize that, hey, I need to be a little bit easier on diving for some balls and things like that. As a you know near 300-pound person, I think that when you crash into a wall and you, you know, crash and, you know, dive for a ball, you just got that much more weight colliding on your bones and your ligaments and things like that. Mm -hmm. He's got all the talent in the world. He can rob home runs and jump at the wall and things like that. But I think he just needs to be a little bit easier on crashing into stuff. And I think he'll get through the season. Uh, for me, he's not a guy that is going to generally have leg problems. It's, 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 it seems to be all be like impact injuries that he had the hit by mm -hmm. a pitch and then he had the, uh, you know, dive and the collarbone thing. So and that's, that's the thing. I mean, like, Aaron Judge, yeah, he has had a few injuries that are like, you know, tissue injuries and whatnot. But a lot of people just seem to gloss over the fact that in, in 2018, after his historic rookie year, he was on pace for a 280 average, 400 on base, like 550 slugging season, hitting over 40 home runs. And then he gets hit by a 95 mile an hour fastball in the wrist. Then right. comes back in the postseason, tears a cover off the ball, was like the only Yankee hitter in that 2018 postseason to perform. Um, so yeah, people gloss over that. And then 2019, this man, they want to, they want to call him soft. This man in 2019, in September, he dove for a ball, trying to make a play for his pitcher, broke his rib, collapsed his lung, refused to sit out, went on to play every single out of the postseason, which is another thing people gloss over. Yeah. He's had his problems with injuries, whichever way you want to put it. He has not missed one out of the postseason, which to me, like that resonates with me. Um, cause this guy, he, he's all about. I, he, he's like Derek Jeter in the sense that all that matters is winning. And the fact that he's always there for the postseason, even though he did have a bad, bad postseason this year, which by the way, he hit three home runs. His three homers were all go ahead home runs. Just throwing that out there. But yeah, I mean, eventually he's going to have to have like a, a 145 plus game season. And I'm hoping that comes this year. You know, I'm not as convinced as everybody else is that he's like injury prone. He's never going to play like more than 120 games a year because the sample size is still pretty small. You know, I mean, he came up in 2017, had a full healthy year that year. 2018 would have been the same if not for the broken uh, the broken wrist. So, I mean, 2020, I mean, that was kind of a hit in my argument about that he's not injury prone because, you know, he has like the like the, the, the calf strain and then he gets put back on the IL. But if he can just put together 140 games this year or any year, really, I mean, he's going to contend for an MVP. That's how good of a player he is. What's your take on John Carlos Stanton? Because – he, he's kind of got that injury prone label a little bit too now, but mm -hmm. I'm real. I'm still really high on John Carlo because we saw what he did when he came back. There's something to be said for just hitting the ball really, really hard most of the time. And he does yeah. that. And we saw when he gets into that groove, like he, he was on a groove in the playoffs, like he was during his MVP season when he hit damn near 60 home runs. Mm -hmm. If he can do that and stay healthy for a, a season, he's going to be a monster. He's going to make everyone yeah. forget about, his troubles over the past couple of years. Yeah. I mean, anybody who disputes like Giancarlo Stanton being a great player, like that's once again, like the moron filter, like they're just not a smart baseball person. 
Um, because Giancarlo Stan, I mean, he, he's a fantastic baseball player. He's an MVP. I think the thing is, is that one, obviously the injuries. I mean, him, I'd be more comfortable with him like being called injury prone because there's a difference between Judge, like still playing over 100 games every year and landing on the IL, than Stanton, I mean, who in 2019 played 18 games. You know, and he had injury issues in the past. Um, and a lot of his are like muscle injuries. But um, the thing with Stanton is that when he looks good, like he looks really good, but when he looks bad, he looks terrible, you know? Yeah. Um, but the same deal as with Judge. I mean, if he can just stay on the field for like 130 games a year, which I'm glad the Yankees are going to make him the full-time DH. I think that ought to help. Um, and he's a guy with like what you said with Judge, how he should kind of just ease up a little bit. For Stanton, like, bro, just, just try to stay healthy, hit home runs, don't bust it out of the box. And like, that's all I need you to do. Um, and I saw the New York Post article they put out the other day about how Stanton is kind of like a, he's making the Yankees financial situation tough. Um, and a lot of people were like bashing them for that article. And I love Stanton to death, but that's not wrong. Like no matter what you feel about Giancarlo Stanton, his contract, it is hindering the Yankees a little bit to have financial flexibility. So I think you can kind of feel both sides, you know, and be like, man, maybe the Yankees shouldn't have gotten him, but also recognize that he is a really good player and we're a much better team when he's on the field. As we saw in the postseason, I mean, he went on a historic run. He hit just as many homers as A-Rod did in 09 in like, what, 10 less games. Yeah. So, I mean, if you think he, if he had a full postseason, he probably sets the record, but he just, he's got to stay healthy. You know, it's like an easy answer, but he just really does. I'm excited about a full year of Clint Frazier. I think he's going to finally get that shot. And I think that he better, he better get, get a shot. He has to, sorry, go on. I think he's a 35 home run guy waiting to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the fact that he got as, as much better on defense as he did over the course of one year, it tells me, it tells me two things about him. One, it tells me he's still improving. And two, it tells me that he's a, he's a hard worker and he's focused on baseball. When I came, when he came up, it seemed to me like, um, you know, he, he paid a lot of attention on shoes and he was a little bit more fashion over function, but it seemed like maybe that trip down to the minor leagues um, really kind of, you know, sparked something in him where he realized, Hey, I've got to change what I'm doing. I got to change my approach if I'm going to make it in New York. And whatever adjustments he made, we know he made the physical adjustments of like turning his knee inwards in his stance or whatever, but whatever adjustments he made to his defense and his approach at the plate, he walked more, they've worked. And, and Clint Frazier is on his way now because there's nobody who could argue with his physical talent. And it seems like he's finally channeled that into a full all round ball player. And I think he's going to be an all-star. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely matured a lot, I feel like. But at the same time, like, the media wasn't always too fair to him. I feel like they kind of had it out for him from the beginning, you know? Like, for starters, I mean, like, remember that rumor that was turned that turned out to be false that he requested Mickey Mantle's number? Like, <laughs> who honestly believed that? Like, do we think Clint Frazier is that dumb to request Mickey Mantle's number? No, I never bought that for a second. Two, I mean, the hair issue, like, as far as I know, I mean, Clint Frazier's hair was never longer than what Garrett Cole's is right now. Right. You know, and they made a big, big deal out of that, you know? Um, and as for his defense, a lot of people forget this dog was concussed in 2018. That has an effect on you just by the way you play. I mean, like he may not go as hard for a ball as he would have before the concussion. So it takes a little bit of an adjustment period to kind of get back to how you usually feel in the outfield. And I think that's what we saw, um, this year. He looked so much better. I'm not convinced he's going to be like a gold glove defender, you know, but definitely not as bad as we saw him in the previous year. And I think it's just because of the concussion, you know, he's still adjusting from that. I had, he should be real good. I had a theory on his defense too. It's a lot of his defensive struggles were happening when he was doing the whole shoe thing. And I feel like maybe changing your shoes every day affects the way that you're landing in the outfield when you're making, when you're running and trying to keep your eye on the ball, Mm -hmm. it can cause the ball to bounce up and down or, you know, just kind of, you know, give you a different feel. You see a lot of guys stick with the same cleats day after day. And I feel like changing them every day couldn't have had Mm -hmm. a, good impact no i mean that's a good point i didn't even think about that but yeah the, the shoe thing that's i guess like a a rightful knock on him in a sense and like the thing is is that like anything you do that's like polarizing in new york when you're playing well nobody cares you know they're gonna say oh it's cool like clint Frazier, you've got a dope shoe collection and then when you're struggling it's like oh it's a distraction he's not focused on the right things um so i think it's good that he got pat i guess he's not passing he's still you know he still gets his shoes and whatnot but he doesn't really post about it as much as it's not a, as big of a thing um, so I think like with all the distractions aside on Clint and now that I think he's fully embraced by Yankee fans, 
that I think he's kind of feeling a little more comfortable going into this year. And he better get a starting spot. You would figure he would, you know, if Stan's going to be the DH. Only thing that makes me a little bit nervous is I could totally see the Yankees bringing back Brett Gardner on like a one-year deal to be a fourth outfielder. And then he's starting every day come the second week of April. I could totally see that happening. Um, which if I was Clint, like if that did happen to me, bro, requesting a trade hundred percent, I'm honestly surprised he hasn't at this point because I've been very critical of Clint Frazier, but this dog, he deserved a starting job like in 2019, you know, he's been getting screwed for years. So yeah, this- I thought it was odd that, you know, that you put him in for uh, a playoff game and he hits an upper deck home run in his first at bat. And then he gets benched the rest of the series. Yeah. To me, that it was tough. Matter. He had some bad luck for the fact that like Gardner didn't hit all year and then come September, he's yeah. just red hot and just rides it into the playoffs. But uh, yeah, I mean, with Clint, like how many games did he even start in the postseason? It was like one or two and he one looked two. good. Yeah. It, it, yeah and, he, and he looked good in both of them. And the thing I like about Clint is that like how before I mentioned, like when Stanton looks good, he looks really good. And when he looks bad, he looks really bad with Clint. Like he always puts together a competent at bat. I feel like for the most part, he's one of those guys that I just have trust in when he's at the plate, you know? So I think it'll be good to have one of those guys that like almost like with not on the level of DJ LeMahieu, but a player that like if there's a runner on second base with two outs, you don't feel totally hopeless like you do when say Stanton is cold, you know, or Gary's cold. You know, right. like, I always feel I, I I trust Clint when he's at the plate. Yeah, Clint. What I like about his approach is that even when he's cold, he's not a swing and miss guy. He's a yeah. he's a he's a guy who can shorten up and make contact. Mm-hmm. His bat speed allows him to wait a little bit longer. So he's not going to be overmatched most of the time. He reminds me a lot of Jorge Posada in his at-bats, where even when he's slumping, he'll have a long at-bat. He'll work the count. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I always like Posada, you know, for that. He was just a tough, tough out. Yeah. Um, The the other thing I'm excited about, uh, where I want to get your take on, is Luis Severino. Um, I feel like having Luis Severino come back, and if it is a shortened season, you're not going to miss – as much of this, you know, a larger percentage of the season as he would if it started on time. Mm -hmm. Uh, I feel like having him back is kind of an underrated addition. He's always pitched well. I mean, aside from the first, when he first came up, he struggled a few times and got sent back down. But since he's come back up and developed more depth on his slider, he's been pretty much lights out. Occasionally he'll have one of those days where he throws a hundred pitches by the fourth inning that yeah. happened in the playoffs a couple times, but I feel like uh, as he develops into a more uh, seasoned pitcher, he's going to learn how to get quicker outs. I feel like he's a, a Justin Verlander in waiting, you know, a guy who can dominate for, you know, six or seven mm. years if he, once he's healthy. A hundred percent long-term, but I actually, I disagree with you in the sense of, of this year. I actually think it, I don't want to rely too much on him coming back. Um, one, it seems like the Yankees, they always do that. You know, like in 2015, when he first came up, they didn't get a starter because they're going to call him up. In 2019, they didn't get a starter because he was returning from injury. This year, like I totally buy into Luis Severino as a pitcher, obviously. I mean, he put back, back-to-back Cy Young caliber years, 2017 to 2018. But him coming off Tommy John surgery, I mean, that does make me a little bit nervous. You know, um, sure. we've seen pitchers in the past, like there is a little bit of an adjustment period. Um, and even just what Aaron Hicks said the other day, saying how his arm still doesn't feel right after Tommy John and how much of an impact will that have on a pitcher compared to, you know, a hitter. Um, but I am totally feeling good about Severino if the Yankees go and get another starter to push him into the number three spot, because I just I'm not sure if I can bank on Sevy being the Sevy that we know until 2021, to be honest. Um, but if you get like a number two starter, whoever that may be, and you can have whole trade acquisition or free agent signing, then Seve be your number three, then I'm feeling pretty good. But I could totally see a situation happening where the Yankees are relying on Seve to follow Cole and it doesn't turn out too well because I'm not sure if he's going to be able to give us the innings, especially in the postseason. Like, are we going to be able to get like five, six, seven innings dominant out of Seve? Because even when he was healthy, he was struggling with that in the postseason, you know? Um, Yeah. But yeah, I'm high on him long-term. It's just this year I'm a little bit hesitant to where I would go and get another starter. If, if you had $30 million to spend, would you give the bulk of it to DJ LeMahieu or would you go out and get a pitcher? Bro, I'm so torn on this, so torn. Because if we don't get DJ, then I think we revert back to the 2018 team, which put up great offensive numbers, like when you look at it as a whole. But they, were, they just looked lifeless at the plate at times. I could totally see that being the case if we lose DJ. But at the same time, it seems like if that's what we do, resign DJ, that's all we're going to be doing this offseason. You know? And there's so many other holes in this team 
I've gone on about the pitching, but like the relief or uh, the bullpen as well. We need, I think, at least one other reliever, you know. Agreed. Um, but I mean, if I was given the Yankees, if I was put into the Yankees financial situation, they just had 30, 30 million to spend. I would honestly probably just re-sign DJ and then it's mandatory. We got to upgrade at the deadline because just bringing back DJ, like I don't think that's enough because the 2020 team wasn't enough. The 2019 team, you could argue, wasn't enough. And then we'd be really just getting worse because we're losing Tanaka and Paxton, you know? Um, so ideally maybe re-sign DJ for, I don't know, maybe they can get him for 20 mil a year over five years, hopefully not 25, and then take that 10 million to maybe bring Paxton back on a one-year prove-it deal, get Corey Kluber on a one-year prove-it deal, or even bring back Tanaka for like three years, 10 to 12 million, you know? Uh, but it, it's a good, you can make a good argument to not bring back DJ and put it somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I got I caught a lot of flack because the other day I suggested that, um, you know, maybe you don't spend on DJ. Maybe you go get a pitcher. Maybe you spread it around. You know, DJ is a, is a great hitter. He's a great defensive player, but he's in his 30s. And I don't blame Cashman for saying, here's my limit to, to which yeah. I'll go. And then, uh, you know, at that point, I'm going to look in other places. So, Dan, appreciate it. Um, This was uh, super enlightening. Uh, I wish you a ton of luck with your channel. Continue to grow and uh, have to have you back on a few times during the season and and make it a regular thing. Yeah, for sure, man. This was a blast. We got to do it more often. I appreciate you having me on, man. And good luck with your channel and everything. It won't be long before you're passing me, bro. I'm watching you. (laughs) You're going to pass me. I'm putting it by the end of the year. You're going to be by me. Appreciate it, man. Thanks. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. It helps other Yankees fans find the channel. Sponsorships are always available, so feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at NYYRecaps. Thanks for watching.